इंडस्ट्रियल केमिस्ट्री फ्रॉम द छत्रपति शिवाजी महाराज महाराव महाराज कानपुर यूनिवर्सिटी एंड देन ही मूव टू आई आई बॉम्बे एज ए रिसर्च स्कॉलर एट द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बायो साइंस एंड बायो इंजीनियरिंग अंडर द सुपरविजन ऑफ डॉक्टर प्रोफेसर आशुतोष कुमार एंड इफ यू टॉक अबाउट द करंट पोजीशन तो करेंटली ही इज टेक्निकल इंचार्ज ऑफ एन एम आर फैसिलिटी बिट्स प्लानिंग गोवा कैंपस एंड ही हैज साउंड नॉलेज ऑफ एंड एक्सपीरियंस इन द प्रोटीन एन एम आर एंड प्रोटीन डायनेमिक्स and today he will explain now how how nmr statement work and their application of the nmr spectroscopy in protein and bio pharmaceuticals because nowadays nmr is very much important tools for the characterization of the any molecule like uh, for the organic and inorganic people they firstly to nmr for the their characterization so i guess this talk will be more interesting and more interesting for all of us so now uh, sir over to you please start your presentation yeah, thank you shubham hi all uh, this is lakshmi khatri here so uh, today i will give you a talk on uh, nmr spectroscopy and its application in uh, protein and especially in biopharmaceutical because biopharmaceutical is like a very emerging uh, industry like uh, in later on you will see all the medicines they will they will be like uh, protein based medicines So for their analysis, and what is a very important tool, just like small molecules uh, now in water. Actually, I have a humble request to you, please uh, on your video. Oh, I have just joined you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So, can you all see me? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. So. Like uh, NMR is a very popular tool now for uh, biopharmaceutical industry also, just like small molecules. So today I will brief about like uh, how NMR works. Not like uh, too much of basics of uh, NMR, pulse flow graph and quantum mechanics. Uh, very like two or like two or three slides only. Like how uh, NMR works and how we get a signal. And then I will move on to the basic applications of 2D NMR. Like what we do for. in proteins and peptides so like we what experiments we do for proteins and peptides and then i will come to the advanced uh, topic of uh, nmr for uh, biopharma industry like some advanced nmr experiments that uh, mostly biopharma industry use or they are developing and we are also doing research in biopharma only so if i start from this uh, first page only really, if you see in this left side this is a typical pulse program or pulse block of nmr experiment i will explain this later like what these things are there like phi and all these uh, pulses and blocks and then in the middle this is a schematic uh, design like in the middle you can see this is a test tube it's nmr tube actually so we put sample in this nmr tube those who have used nmr one ever they know like this uh, this is called as a nmr tube like we put our sample in this thing this b not uh, denotes magnetic field we all know b not means magnetic field and this is a uh, protein sample and there are two part of this protein fab and fc for uh, for antibody we have two parts of antibody fab and fc region and then we have generated a spectra for two different molecules suppose originator and biosimilar like two um, biopharma products so this is a schematic design of this front page so next i will explain about uh, yeah so uh, this uh, like nmr i told you like nmr is a very a very wide technique which is like uh, used almost in like in every field as you can see agriculture medicine soil science food science forensic science even imaging mri is also nmr magnetic resonance imaging that is also nmr only and what i will cover i will cover this structural uh, biology part and especially biopharma and proteins was well, like my research background is in structural biology like i think there are many chemists also so it is useful for chemistry people also like after this uh, presentation you guys will have a big like, idea how nmr works and what are the experiments uh, you are going to do in your phd or in your research life so 
I will just give a brief introduction how uh, nuclear magnetic resonance works. So NMR is the short form for nuclear magnetic resonance. There are three terms. First is nuclear, second is magnetic, and third is resonance. So very briefly, I will cover this. What are these three terms? So we all know like uh, molecules are made up of atoms and atom atoms, uh, atom has nuclei. Like all uh, uh, all the samples, whatever sample you have, they have nuclei present in that, and they are like in random order. They are arranged in a random way, like this. So, and we know that like all nuclei possesses a, a tiny magnetic charge, or they work as a tiny magnets. So, what we do in NMR? So, this was like the first part, nuclear. Like in like every atom has nucleus. So, like this is a very simple thing, nuclear. Then we will go to magnetic. That is a magnet. So when we will put our external magnetic field along with these uh, uh, nuclei in a sample, like in a sample tube with a magnetic field, external magnetic field, what will happen? The small uh, nuclei will align towards this magnetic field, which is a very high magnetic field, like in in, in like eight tesla, ten tesla, or fourteen tesla. Which if you convert in megahertz, like five hundred megahertz, six hundred megahertz, seven hundred megahertz, that is the strength of a, a NMR magnet. So this is known as B naught, which is a very strong magnetic field, external magnetic field. So what will happen? All these random nuclei will align to a specific uh, direction, either parallel or anti-parallel. Like it's a class twelve phenomenon only. Like we have two spin states. So either they will align parallel or anti-parallel. Okay. So now if I uh, if I explore this picture more, if you see this here in this uh, uh, in this picture. See, all these pink arrows are different spins. Like we know, like we have two spin states, plus half or alpha or minus half or beta. Like every nuclei uh, have a spin uh, property, like plus half or minus half. This is also glass twelve concept only. So if you see here, like these spins are divided in, in plus half a state and minus half a state. But according to Boltzmann distribution law, like in one state some spins are more. That means some half spins are more. Or uh, minus half spins are more, but they they are, they cannot be equal. That means there will always be a uh, difference between these two spins. So what will happen? Like plus half f and minus half, they most of them will be cancel out. But since they are not equal, so some of the spins will remain in one particular direction. Suppose we say this is m not. So here I am removing the plus half the, the spins those which are canceling out. But still, we have some spins will that uh, like the, they will denote as a M naught. So this thing is known as net macroscopic magnetization or bulk magnetization. This is the important thing that we use in NMR. So suppose you have any nuclei, it has a spins. It a spins means uh, nuclei. Both are like same terms. So then, what will happen? These nuclei will align to the external magnetic field that is your magnet, and then these uh, nuclei, some spins will cancel out because they have like Proportion plus half and minus half, so some will be cancelled out, but still some spins will be there that will be aligned to this perp perpendicular z direction, and this vector we known as uh, m not or uh, yeah m not or some people say it's b one also. So if I further explore this thing, if I remove this thing, you see, you will see like this this uh, this is a single spin, and this is precising around this. Z axis precision means it's just uh, revolving like this. If you can see my hand, if suppose this is the thing and this is like revolving like this, just like a spin top. The spin top we used to play in our childhood. It's it used to precise around a particular axis. You see this plus mark. So these spin these spins are like precising around a particular perpendicular Z axis. And this phenomenon is known as resonance. We all know. So now these spins are resonating along this Z axis, which is uh, perpendicular to this external magnetic field. So these, uh, they, from this picture, you can understand what is NMR. Like this is nuclear, and then a magnet, and then resonance. So we call it nuclear magnetic resonance. So next part is that how we get a signal, and how we acquire an NMR spectrum. So again, from this picture, if you see, uh, again we have this plus half and minus half energy states. And one M not vector which is perpendicular to external magnetic field. So what happened in an NMR instrument? Like there is a probe. We call it a probe in which samples sit just in the center of the magnet. So in that probe, we have some 
RF coils or RF input units. And then there is a receiver coil in the XY plane. So, okay, so like our spins are here perpendicular to this external magnet. And then what we will do, we will apply a RF energy. I will explain you later what is RF. RF means radio frequency, like it's a wave only, which, uh, which has a small magnetic uh, um, phenomena in that, like a very small magnetic field, we will apply through this X axis. So what will happen? Some of the spins, those are already in precision with this external magnetic field, will, uh, will uh, absorb this, uh, like they will also uh, get a phenomena of this B1 uh, uh, or RF energy. So now some of the uh, spins, will process around this B1 field, X1. So when we uh, give RF from here, so our this bulk magnetization or M0 or net magnetization vector, that will comes to our XY plane. So the spins, those were earlier precision around uh, this plus Z axis. Now they are precision around XY axis in our, wherever receiver is there. So receiver means like the signals or whatever the spins are coming here, the receiver will collect the signal. So this is the first principle, first thing that we have to put an external small energy for some time, which is known as RF or radio frequency. That will tilt this M0 into XY plane. Okay. But we will not continuously flow this RF. Like we will flow this in a manner, like for some time, and then again we will release, and then again we will stop and again we will release. That will explain later in the next slides. So here, uh, sorry. So here, if you see, like all those spins are coming down, and suppose we have removed this RF here. From here, we have removed this RF. So again, this M naught, which is coming down to X Y, that will go back to Z again. As you remove this RF, that is external small B one field, again that will go back to M naught. So what will happen? Just suppose if you see this small molecule like uh, ethanol, CH three CH two OH. Suppose you want in NMR, we record particular nuclei like 1H known as proton, carbon that in 13C, oxygen we rarely record. So suppose you want to acquire the signals for these protons, that is 1H. So if you see here, like this H will has a like different chemical environment, a different surrounding. This is attached to O. Then again, these two H has a different chemical surrounding and these three H has a different chemical surroundings. That means all these nuclei, which are already work as a small magnets, have a uh, different kind of surroundings. That means their overall magnetic uh, spins or magnetic field, they are uh, feeling will be changed. Like this, uh, this edge is feeling a different magnetic environment. These two are feeling different magnetic env environment and these three are feeling different magnetic environment. So they will behave similarly in this area when we apply this RF. So some of them will come down fast. Some of them will come down slow. Similarly, when you remove this RF, some of them will go back fast and some of them will go back slow. This thing known as relaxation in NMR, which is very important. On the basis of this relaxation property of particular nuclei, we get a signal. So here on the basis of time, one one signal will get uh, converted here. Like just suppose this H comes down, so it, it has recorded this edge. Then after that, these CH2 is coming, so it has recorded this CH2. Then these CH3 is coming, it has recorded this CH3. So small, small signals we will collect here, and we will uh, repeat this process many times, which is known as number of scans, how many times you are giving scans. So this process will repeat n number of times, so you say 50 number of times. So 50 times you will collect data here, a raw data, which is known as which is like collected in time domain because you are collected data, data on a different seconds, one second, two second, three second, and then so on. So this is a raw, a raw data, which is known as FID. Like this is a technical term, free induction decay. I will not go on all those techniques. So this is a raw data and this we will convert into FT known as Fourier transform. This is a mathematical function, which will convert this raw data into a digital format and you will get the NMR spectrum. If you see these lines, if you have seen a 1H spectrum, I will show you later how a 1H spectrum looks like. So these small, small uh, signals you will get here, like this H you will get somewhere here, this CH2 you will get somewhere here, and this CH3 you will get somewhere here as hertz or in the uh, magnetic field, like this axis will be in hertz because the magnetic field we measure in hertz, this B0 is in hertz, 
500 megahertz or 700 megahertz 800 megahertz so you will get these here and this thing is known as chemical shift if you have any idea about nmr this is a very basic thing chemical shift means like a single nuclei have a different chemical environment and, and on the basis of that they will appear on the spectrum so suppose if, if this h is coming here so this has the chemical shift of 4 uh, 4 ppm suppose this is coming at 3 this is 3 ppm this is coming at 2 this is 2 ppm so because they have the different chemical environment that's why their chemical shift or the where the signal is appearing will be different so this from these two slides, you can understand how NMR works. That is nuclear magnetic resonance. You got the nuclear uh, work of magnet and resonance, and then the work of RF. What the RF is doing. Next, this is a brief concept of RF pulse and pulse block. Like pulse sequence is a like integral part of NMR spectroscopy. There are various pulse program. The in the first slide, where I where I showed you the left, there was a big pulse block. So this is a very simple pulse block. And what is the RF? See, RF is a nothing but this is just a simple short burst of energy which contains external magnetic field or which have a small magnetic field. So, what if you see here how to uh, read a pulse sequence or a pulse block or, or a pulse diagram? When you do NMR or when you uh, download the software, you will see this kind of a image or a block. So, what we have here, this is our uh, RF pulse. Pi not uh, pi by two means ninety degree. Like we are giving a ninety degree, a perpendicular RF pulse. If you see here, this RF energy, which is perpendicular to Z and Y in the x-axis, we are giving. So this pi by two is a RF pulse. And here TRD means time for recycle delay. What is recycle delay? Recycle delay is nothing like how much uh, delay we are going to give. This D one is a, a recycle delay time. This is usually in seconds. Suppose this is two seconds and this is in microseconds. Suppose uh, five microseconds, 90 degree pulse. Because you cannot give uh, RF pulse for a longer duration, then the probe will heat and your sample will be uh, like, like, it will damage the probe and sample both. So this is in microseconds. And this phenomena we will repeat many times. So this you have to relate with this diagram here when we give this rf energy these spins will come down to x y axis and then we will record this thing acquire this thing same thing is happening here this rf pulse is coming and what this is acquisition that means we are recording the signal this is a particular diagram for fid known as free induction decay so these spins are coming down we are acquiring okay suppose you have uh, collected 10 spins from this first pulse sequence. There are two seconds of recycle delay, 10 microsecond of uh, 90 degree pulse, and then we acquire. So we will repeat this process n number of times. Then again, same thing, same pulse block will happen after some delay, like two seconds of delay, same phenomena will occur. Then again, same phenomena will occur. So like in n number of times, you will collect n data points here. And then you will convert those n data points into by Fourier transform, and then you will get your NMR spectrum. So this is how a uh, NMR, a 1H NMR spectrum generated of any molecule. This is a small molecule, ethanol. Then, uh, since I don't want to go into the like too much basics of uh, pulse sequence and uh, quantum physics and pulse theory, I will go into I will move on to the application parts. So this is how uh, 1D and 2D uh, uh, spectrum look like. So this is a 1D. That is a 1D proton or 1D1H protein NMR spectrum. How if you record a protein or peptide, this is a, a signature spectrum for any protein or peptide. So in an NMR scale, we have on the x-axis known as PPM, that is parts per million or chemical shift value. This is a chemical shift value. I think you all have learned in chem, in BSc or in MSc in chemistry, what is chemical shift? So like this is CH3, CH2OH. This OH has a, a a different chemical shift this ch2 has a different chemical shift this ch3 is a different chemical shift chemical shift is nothing it's just the environment of your protons like where it is surrounding so we have a, a characteristic for a protein like between 0 to 2 ppm you will get methyl protons that is ch3s and between like uh, uh, 3 to 5 you will get h alpha in a protein h alpha that is a proton alpha will come between 3 to 5 and then 6 to 8 you will get aromatic protons and from 9 to 10, you will get backbone NH between in this region. And above 10, you will get uh, NH of tryptophan and other uh, amino acid, which contain extra NH. 
uh, in their side chain. So this is a typical signature uh, spectrum of a protein, one H, I mean one D protein spectrum. And here in this side we have a two D protein spectrum. So in NMR we have two type of experiments. One D is like very simple. There is only one dimension you are getting one H or either thirteen C or fifteen N. We can record any which has which contain only one nuclei that is known as one D NMR. But here, if you get uh, information for two nuclei, if you see here, one H is there and 13 C is there. So suppose if I choose this thing, A14B, that is alanine 14B. So we are getting chemical shift for this at proton dimension as well as carbon dimension. So this is known as a 2D NMR, which gives you information for two different nuclei. Okay, and then some more, uh, like some more uh, characters, uh, like some more uh, things are there. Suppose this is a heteronuclear NMR because these two uh, nuclei are different. This is 1H and this is 13C. If I put 1H here and 1H here, that is known as homonuclear NMR. Homo means similar. That is homonuclear means if two similar nuclei are there on the XY axis. If they are different, it is heteronuclear NMR. These are like very simple things. If you go in an NMR lab, if somebody asks you what NMR you want, heteronuclear or homonuclear, that means he's asking either like both uh, both nuclei are same or are different. So this is a heteronuclear uh, 2D NMR. I will explain you later what these experiments are. And then this is a applied, uh, like this is my spectra. I have recorded this one. So if you see here, this is a 1D spectrum of two biopharmaceutical trastuzumab and rituximab. These two are uh, uh, monoclonal based uh, medicines, monoclonal based antibody medicine. This is used for breast cancer and this is used for uh, RA, rheumatoid arthritis. So if you see this, this is these two are like in formulation, like whatever medicine you get in a vial, in a liquid. So we have recorded 1H NMR for these two different samples, trastuzumab and rituximab. If you see here, I have characterized the excipients here, polysorbate, sodium citrate, and these alistidine, tra trehalos, and other things. So these are the excipients that we can find out from 1H spectrum of any biopharmaceutical or any pharmaceutical thing, which have excipients. Excipients means um, compounds that carry the API molecule. If you guys know about um, uh, medicine, there are two components. API means active pharmaceutical ingredient and excipient, which hold that API. So if you just suppose if you take a medicine known as paracetamol, so its API is paracetamol, but it has some excipients or fillers also that will contain that API. That is a drug product. A complete drug product is consist of API and excipients. So this is a drug product. And here we have, these are the excipient signals that we can characterize from 1HNMR. And these are the signals of proteins that will explain you later, like what, how I get this, these are the signals of proteins. So anybody has any doubt till here? No, sir, you can uh, finish then, everybody can pass. Yeah, okay, sure. So then uh, there are some like important 2D NMR experiments for peptide and protein assignment in like for, Protein and peptide, like they are big molecules. We usually do 2D NMR, not 1D NMR. 1D NMR is, as you can see here, like 1D is very complicated. If you want to resolve these peaks, you cannot. But if you want to resolve the peaks, you can do a 2D NMR. All these methyl protons you can see here in a very resolved manner. So that's why we move to 2D NMR, which is like much more resolved technique. That's why we have to use 2D NMR. So first experiment is 1H, 1H toxic. This is a small, this is a short name. Total correlation spectroscopy, toxic. This is a very common NMR experiment. You all will know when you do NMR. And then we have, so what it does, toxic? So it helps to identify uh, a specific toxic is like, uh, suppose you have a chain of protons attached in any molecule, like uh, one, two, three, four. H1, H2, H3, H, H4. So all four or whatever protons are there, those are correlated with one bond, two bond, or three bond, three bond, you will get in toxic. So this is known as total correlation spectroscopy. Then you will come to nosy. This is very useful for organic people also, nuclear horizon effect spectroscopy. So what it does, it helps you to identify sequential assignment of peptide sequence. Okay, I will leave peptide. Let's talk about like uh, 
application in a small molecule suppose uh, you have a molecule in a 3d shape suppose you have one uh, like one suppose you have, you have to find out r and s configuration so like one proton is upside and one proton is downside proton is uh, hydrogen where the hydrogen is attached you want to know so what you will do you will run a noisy spectrum a noisy nmr for your molecule so it will give you a spatial that means a uh, information regarding 3d space like which proton is upside and which proton is downside within six angstrom radius so if your proton is within six angstrom you will get a signal in noisy spectrum if it is beyond six angstrom you will not get any uh, signal so this is very useful to know the uh, 3d structure of any small molecule and then for peptide pattern that uh, again useful for to know what is surrounding in your six angstrom radius this is this will work only up until six angstrom radius like whatever same nuclei are there in six angstrom you will get it from a noisy experiment third is 1h15 and hsqc hsqc stand for heteronuclear single quantum coherence see 1h15n these two are like heteroatoms this is heteronuclear single quantum coherence this will give you 1h15n correlation very easy just like 1h1h just like this 1h13 you see this is this will give you 1h15n correlation so if you have any idea about a peptide chain there is uh, several nh attached like r ch nh r ch nh so those nh we can get from or we can get the fingerprint from this 1h15 and hsqc and then uh, this is very uh, this is a very common experiment 1h13c hsqc again heteronuclear single quantum coherence just like 1h15 and this will give you correlation between 1h and 13c this will give you an idea about aromatic and aliphatic regions where the aromatic uh, carbons are attached where are the aliphatic region is attached in your amino acid peptide or in a uh, small molecule and then one term uh, like all the biologists or those who work in uh, protein and mr they use this thing bmrb that is biological magnetic resonance data bank it is a online data bank uh, available on internet so here you can see the chemical shift this average shift, shift means the chemical shift of of particular amino acid alanine arginine aspartame whatever amino acids you have you will get chemical shift of each and every atom h alpha h beta carbon carbon alpha carbon beta and this h means the nh the peptide which is the nh the backbone peptide you will get here so these are the chemical shift average reference chemical shift that we use during um uh, sequencing our peptide or protein like what things are attached so if you show here like how to do assignment for a peptide or or small amino acid so see we have this tori toxi that uh, this is a typical toxic pattern for different amino acids like uh, alanine valine isoleucine serine so what we have here this this will give you amide protons and i will explain you from here this if you see this isoleucine we have this uh, c alpha c beta c gamma c delta okay and this nh is attached here so if we recall a toxi i told you before the toxi will will give you a entire chain like whatever protons are connected in a chain it will give you so here if you see this nh will come and then just above this this beta h will come and above gamma will come here delta will come so all the alpha beta gamma uh, protons you will get from toxi from here alpha beta gamma delta and this nh that, that's why we known as this is known as total correlation so this is giving you a total correlation of all the protons that are that are attached in a single chain so here you will, you can see this all these four dots are showing this toxic pattern for each and every amino acid we have this toxic specific toxic pattern like how many peaks we will get for valine how many peaks we will get for isoleucine how many peaks we will get for leucine so on the basis of these amino acids we will uh, do the assignment of our peptide or protein so this uh, this is a live example like i have recorded this toxic for my sample so you can see like if you if i draw a strip here so just like this if you draw a strip here you will get these peaks here so like this is a live example then again what 1h13 ch is to see if you so here if you see between 0 to 2 or 0 to 3 bpm you will get aliphatic carbons 
and here you will get aromatic correlation just like this similar one if you see here these uh, aromatic protons and methyl or aliphatic region similarly if you recorded 2d you will get much more resolved spectra that's why we use 2d so here you will get all your 2d peaks aliphatic correlation peaks and here you will get your aromatic peaks which is very easy just you just have to remember this chemical shift value between 0 to 2 or 0 to 3 you will get alif aliphatic and beyond this you will get aromatic then we come to uh, this uh, 1h15 and hsuc what it is it will give you an entire fingerprint of your peptide so, so suppose this is this peptide we have what is peptide peptide is nothing just um, if you attach many amino acid it will form a peptide i think everybody knows about what, what is a peptide so this is suppose a 12 or 14 chain long peptide if you want to fingerprint this molecule here so what we will get around this 12 10 or 12 dots here these dots these dots are known as contours, 2D contours. In a 2D spectra, we know this is known as contour. In 1D, we get a peak. In 2D, we get a contour. This is spheres. So each and every single dot or contour will represent this amino acid. This is the last step. We have got here by the help of these experiments, Toxi, Nozi, and HSUC. And then finally, we have fingerprint our peptide on this 1H15 and HSUC. This is the fingerprint of your molecule. Like these are the chemical shift where you'll get your uh, NH um, NH proton or uh, your uh, peptide. Each and every peptide you can see here. So just suppose if you have this peptide and if you want to design an experiment, just suppose like one small drug is interacting with uh, this uh, lysine K. So how you will know? So what we can do? We can do an MR uh, experiment for this peptide and that drug. So if you have already mapped all these things here, only then you will know like what changes are happening because you know this uh, uh, this lysine is here, 16K. So if any changes happening in this spectrum after adding that drug, that means that is actually interacting with your peptide or whatever molecule you have. So that's why these are the like basic and important experiments for peptides and proteins. We have like four experiments, Toxi, Nozi, and uh, 1H15 and HSQC and 1H13 CHSQC. Toxi will give you an entire correlation in a chain, in a peptide chain. Nozi will give you what are the neighboring atoms. And then HSQC will give you a fingerprint of your entire protein, like how many amide or backbone is attached. And then 1H13 will give you aromatic region. Next, I will move on to some advanced NMR experiments for biopharmaceuticals that I also used uh, during like last three years. And this is very useful for biopharma industry and for other purposes also. So these are like advanced experiments. The earlier that I explained, those, those were like uh, say basic experiments. Like if you are using NMR, then you will use those 2D experiments very often. So here, these are some advanced experiments that most people don't use or they don't apply much. So first one is DOZI. That is diffusion ordered spectroscopy. In short form, we call it DOZI. In NMR, we have a lot of short forms. <clears throat> so what DOZI does, like from its name, it's very clear, diffusion ordered. You know, like if you have a mixture of compounds, suppose you have two or three different compounds in a mixture. So every uh, compound has a different molecular weight and it has a different diffusion coefficient. What is diffusion is nothing like how your molecule is traveling in, in, in a solution or in a water. So if it is a large molecule, its diffusion will be less. That is, it will diffuse slowly. And if it is a small molecule, it will diffuse fastly. So what it will do, Dozy, it will separate molecule on the basis of their diffusion coefficient. So I will show you a Dozy spectrum later. And what it gives you in, in terms for like proteins or biopharma, it gives insights for the oligomerization and protein size determination. What is oligomerization? I think you all know, like suppose if we have a monomer, it's going to dimer, trimer, and then oligomer. So mostly proteins have a tendency to like become oligomers, like they will bind together and they will become, they, they will oligomerize and they will make a dimer, trimer, or tetramer. So from this experiment, you can know like whether your protein is uh, like has tetramer or trimer or dimer or monomer, and then you can uh, find its size also, protein size determination. Like what is the RH? Like that RH means um, hydrodynamic radii. What is the size of the protein, which is very important for biopharmaceutical 
like what molecule you are making you should know its size like how big is that second is saturation transfer difference experiment which is known as std nmr this is also a very um, good experiment and advanced experiment that people use uh, in a uh, small uh, molecule industry also to find the drug and peptide interaction or drug drug interaction so what it gives it will give you the insights of protein protein interaction suppose you have two proteins and they are interacting with with each other so how you will know like which part is interacting or not so from this std experiment we can find like which protein protein is interacting with each other and second is protein receptor interaction which is very important in biological science suppose you have a protein in your body a hormone in your body that will attach to a receptor receptor is something that will receptor is a big molecule that get attached to a small protein just suppose in the case of like coronavirus also like we have a uh, messenger rna virus that will uh, that will attach to its receptor and in humans we have ac ac32 receptor so the virus will attach to the receptor so this protein receptor interaction we can also find from std nmr and second is the drug binding studies can be done by students suppose you are working in a drug industry in a pharmaceutical industry and they have make a drug and you you know where it is uh, binding to the protein or to your site where is the drug uh, where is the drug binding site so that drug binding site also you can know from std nmr and third is uh, a little more advanced like for this this methyl trozy that is transverse relaxation optimization spectroscopy this is used for uh, like macromolecules uh, proteins or which has large or mega molecular weight like more than 100 kda which is a very big molecule if you have then you have to use trozy experiment methyl is nothing we will only cover like we will only map the methyls of the proteins because methyl because methyl is a very important uh, region in uh, in any protein structure if you if you map methyls then like our half work is done so this uh, is like very important to have methyl fingerprints of a protein molecule if you have a big protein molecule you can find their methyl peaks by this exp experiment and second this will remove the limitation of large or mega molecular weight proteins so if you in in nmr we have a limitation if you increase the size of your sample in size means if you increase the molecular weight of your sample so like generally we usually do up to 100 kda size we can do easily but if size goes beyond 100 kda we will find very limitation to acquire any spectra like any spectra like hsq co tox whatever so trozy is designed to uh, record spectra for those which has higher molecular weights and mostly in biopharma industry or those which are monoclonal antibody based uh, 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 pharmaceuticals are there they have a very higher molecular weight more than 150 kda so to uh, to find their structure or to find any uh, study on that we use this methyl trozy experiment so now i will explain you these three advanced experiments what uh, i have done on these so this is the application of dose dose nmr for biopharmaceuticals so what i am talking about in this biopharmaceutical see there are two terms originator and biosynthesizer suppose uh, one one company has made one medicine known as originator molecule and now like it's because in pharma industry there is some license processes there suppose its license is expiring and some other company want to make a similar product of this so what we will know if you make a copy of this product that is known as biosimilar so the thing is just a copy of the same thing maybe a different manufacturer is making that is known as biosimilar so to approve this biosimilar there is a, a term called cqa that is um, critical quality assessment there are various analytical techniques which is used to characterize this biosimilars and then they will get approval from fda that is food uh, development authority like in us if you if you want a fda license so nmr is like it plays a very important role to characterize these biosimilars so dozy nmr i told you like what does dozy dozy will give you the size of your protein on the basis of diffusion coefficient so for size determination we have some other techniques also available like dls dynamic light, light scattering from dls you can also find the size but in dls what what we have to do we have to um, we have to dilute our sample like this is a limitation of the instrument dls suppose you have to uh, find the um, you have to find the radius of this biosimilar if you want to do dls you have to 
dilute the sample. But in NMR, you can directly take this from wild and record the NMR spectrum, or, or you can record a dosage spectrum. So from dosage, you will get the hydrodynamic radii and diffusion coefficient. Same thing you will get from DLS also, but in DLS, you have to dilute the sample. And this application DOSI is a, like it's a new uh, method that we have developed. Like this, uh, work, this, work, work, this work is uh, recently published this year only. So here, if you see, there are three things are there. These are like the structure of uh, your protein or biosimilar product. So what we have done, we have calculated its size by computational programming. There is a software known as HydroPro, which will uh, calculate the RH of your um, molecule. These molecules are like uh, available online, known as PDB. PDB file means like it's a protein data bank file. It's a computational file that you can open in a in a software which will which can which will which is used to visualize the molecules, known as uh, PyMol. So in PyMol, you can open these files, these protein structures, and then you can find its uh, radius, its size. So we have find the size using HydroPro. There is a computational program that is used to measure the size. And then what we have done, we have recorded dozy for the same samples. For the same samples, we have recorded dozy, And then we have also done DLS also. So from three techniques, we have used computational method, NMR, and DLS. And then what we have found that the radii is coming very accurate from this dozy NMR. This dozy is giving a very accurate radius for uh, very accurate value for this radii of all these three structure or whatever biosimilar we have, whatever molecule we have. If we record a dozy, we will get a signal here and we will get the radii. For dozy, this is a dozy spectrum here, like 0 to 8 ppm. This is your chemical shift, and here this is diffusion coefficient, diffusion coefficient on the y axis. So this equation is known as a Stokes Einstein equation. From this equation, we can find either diffusion coefficient or hydrodynamic radii. Since in dozy NMR, we get the value of this diffusion coefficient. So here, this D is known. KV is nothing, Boltzmann constant. T is your temperature at what temperature you have recorded your sample. And eta is the viscosity, viscosity of your solution, whatever you think, water or whatever. So this all terms are known. So only R you have to find. So R you can easily find from this equation. So dozy is very useful to find uh, your uh, like radi like your radii of your sample, either protein or a small molecule. Suppose you have a natural product and some mixture are there, and you want to know the size of different molecules. So from if you run a dozy of your sample, then you will get the like some uh, important information you will get, like how big your molecule is there. You will get the radii. That's why this is a very uh, advanced experiment. Most people don't do dozy or they don't know much about dozy. Because they say for NMR, you have to give a pure sample. But if you don't have a pure sample, you can record a dozy NMR, which will give you, which will separate different molecules. So here if you see these, these peaks, which are uh, on a horizontal line, they are protein peaks. Those which are below, they are excipient peaks. So we all know like protein is a very big molecule and excipient like it's a small uh, molecules. So a small molecule has a lower diffusion coefficient and large molecule has a larger diffusion coefficient. So on this spectrum, we can clearly see these are the peaks for excipients. And these are the peaks for protein. Just keep one thing in mind. If when, whenever you're working with a pharmaceutical product, two things are there, API and excipient. API is nothing which is the main active pharmaceutical ingredient that is API that will work when you inject anything in your body that API will work. Excipient is nothing, it is just binding your molecule in the formulation. It's a formulation you will know as excipient. So excipients are showing lower diffusion coefficient value. Next is the application of uh, SCD NMR. This is also like uh, my example only, I'm showing whatever work I have done. So before uh, I'm showing you this STD, and I will, I will uh, give you some brief about insulin and its receptor because this spectra is recorded on insulin and its receptor only. So what is insulin? We all like insulin. I think you most of you have heard about insulin. Insulin, I think it's a hormone that uh, regulates your blood sugar and glucose level in body. So how insulin work? So insulin works by binding to its receptor. We have insulin receptor or insulin growth factor receptor IGFR. 
both receptor are present in our body and this insulin binds with this and then our blood glucose level is controlled by this insulin so this is a structure of uh, um, this receptor like we have our insulin binding domain this insulin attach here and then we have a transmembrane domain which is transmembrane means if you are not from biology oh sorry if you are not from biology like suppose if we have a receptor there is a membrane like one part is above the membrane one, one part is below the membrane so this part is known as transmembrane domain and this is intracellular tyrosine kinase domain that is below this membrane part so what will happen in animation so if you see it suppose we have insulin here and suppose you have taken a lot of sugar or sweets you have eaten. so what will happen your insulin will activate in, in your body so what is going to happen here this will sit on this alpha region this is above this transmembrane region this is extracellular region sorry extra membrane region this is above this membrane so this will sit here what will happen next some biological process will happen here and this entire circle will go on i don't want to explain this like this fossilization will happen and this irs will activate it then pi3k and then akt3 and this will uh, come here glut4 this is the important thing this is a glucose transponder so this glut4 what will happen this glut4 is going to sit here in this membrane so what will happen next this glut4 will take the whatever uh, glucose there in your blood stream it will take it down to the cell and then it will be metabolized so this is how insulin work in your body it's very simple suppose you eat anything it will bind to the receptor known as igfr and then some biological process will go on and this glut4 will come here and then this glut4 sits here in the membrane and then whatever extra glucose you have in your blood it will taken down to the um, cell and then it will further metabolize so what nmr is doing here in this biological process it is insulin is binding to this protein they 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 all, they all are protein insulin is a small peptide like 51 amino acid and this is a very huge protein which is around 1400 amino acids it's a very big protein so what is happening here this insulin is binding here to this alpha subunit and if you see here this is a dynamic process it will attach and remove attach and remove attach and remove so what in nmr we can do in this spectrum so in what we have here this and this is insulin and this sorry and this is your receptor the big molecule since this big molecule we cannot uh, observe in nmr so what we are doing here we have make a mixture for this thing like we have take a nmr tube and we have added uh, this uh, receptor and insulin then we have recorded one spectrum in which there are two terms are there nmr visible and nmr invisible since we are detecting insulin which is a small molecule which is a small peptide these are the signals we'll get for insulin okay so this we this is we call as a off resonance saturation in std two terms are there on resonance and off resonance very simple just like a switch off and on so what happen in off resonance we will not saturate like or we will not give any pulse to this uh, visible part so we'll get the signals from this insulin only then it's a, it's a same mixture only and these two processes are having uh, doing simultaneously off and on off and on off and on so what will ha happen here the one will be, one we will record as off resonance saturation and the other will record on on, on resonance saturation this suppose whatever parts whatever the part or whatever uh, nuclei is attached to this big receptor that will also get saturated here what we are doing we are doing no saturation we are recording a general and mar experiment and here what we are doing we are saturating this big molecule so whatever part is attached to this big molecule will also get saturated so here if you see these peaks are very blur that means their intensity their intensity has gone down that means these are the peaks which are interacting with your receptor which is a very uh, precious important which is a very precious uh, information with respect to this interaction how to uh, proteins uh, are interacting or how a small protein is interacting with the large protein so this interaction also we can capture using nmr that that uh, experiment is known as std nmr saturation transfer difference this is a uh, very advanced application
you guys can also use in your research. And this is a spectrum that I have recorded. If you see here, this blue one is insulin plus IGFR. What is IGFR? IGFR is a receptor and insulin is a small uh, molecule. So we have a mixture of this and mixture of this. Off resonance means we are not uh, doing any saturation on our sample. We are recording a journal uh, uh, NMR spectrum. And then we record a on resonance spectrum. So we are saturating our big molecule. So whatever part is uh, attached with that big molecule that will also get saturated. So here you can see that precious information. Like these uh, pink peaks, some of the peaks have gone down. Their intensity has gone down. So these are the peaks which are interacting with your receptor. So these are the in insulin uh, uh, epitopes which are interacting with the receptor. So how this information is useful in pharmaceutical industry or in research. So now from this information, we know like these are the things which are important for binding with the receptor. So we, we don't have to play with these things. We can play with other things to make a new drug, to form a new drug, to form a new insulin. There are many types of type of insulin are available in market, market like insulin, Detemar, insulin, Tragopil, and uh, normal human insulin. So if you, if you read about insulin, you will see there are many types of insulin, like fast acting insulin, uh, slow acting insulin, and long acting insulin. So on the basis, what how they make those kind of insulin, they just alter the sequence, the primary sequence, they change. And then the action of the insulin gets changed. The mode of action gets changed. So if you know about these things, the either you can play with them to make them more active, so their mode of action become more precise, or you can play with other things to alter their mode of action. That's why this important information you can we can get from NMR. And this, this can be used to any other molecule, like a, like this, this can be used to a small molecule with a large molecule. Suppose you have synthesized a new chemical in your lab as an organic chemist, and you want to know how your chemical is working with a protein, whether it's inhibiting or whatever it's doing with a cell, not with a cell, I mean with a protein, how it is interacting, or with, a, or with other drug molecule, how it is interacting. Or you want to see the cross reaction of two drugs. Then what you will do, you will make a sample for STD NMR and then you will record a STD spec. And from there you will get how your uh, novel drug is interacting with other drug. So this interaction can be seen from uh, NMR. This, this is a very dynamic process. Next is the application for uh, 2D methyl trozine biopharma. How this 2D methyl trozine is used in biopharma. I told you that trozine is useful for uh, molecules which are more than 100 kD or 150 kD. So what you see here, these are nothing to um, a 1D spectrum here. If you see this on your turn, you can sample 1, 2, 3, 4, sample 1, 2, 3, 4. This is a full spectrum, 0 to 10 ppm. And this is a uh, methyl region. I told you that 0 to 2 is the methyl region. So here in this picture, this is a PDB structure. And these is spheres, these different color spheres. These are methyls. Methyl side chains are popping out. So here, these methyls are there. So if you can see, there are so many methyls are there, like hundred of methyls are there. So we should get hundred of peaks here. But those these all peaks are like merged together. So from one D, we cannot do this comparison because there are there is a lot of uh, this is a very clumsy spectra. So there is a lot of overlapping. So then what we'll do? We'll use a two D methyl rosy. So these spheres that you can see here, we are going to map in the animal spectrum. So after recording a 2D methyl rosy, we will get this kind of a spectrum, 1H and 13C. This is acquired between 0 to 2 ppm. 0 to 2 is nothing other than methyl signals. And these lysine, allylene, methane, if you read about amino acids, there are many amino acids which contains methyls only. So there are six amino acids which contain methyl, like lysine, not lysine, lysine this is a CH2 actually, like leucine, valine, isoleucine, methionine, allylene, and theronine. These contains methyl signals. So what we are doing, we are mapping these methyl containing amino acid in the animal spectrum. All these methyls have been contained here. So this is also a very important information. Like you can, why this methyl region is important. One more question is that like why we are doing for methyls only. So if you see, this is a complete big, this is a big protein. This is around 150 kTa. Trust is a member. This FC and FV part. And these brown balls 
are the methyl side chains. So if you see in this complete structure, like more than 75% brown balls you can see. So if you cover methyl region in NMR, that means you are covering 75% of the structure, which is very important. If you, if you get a fingerprint of a protein, which is consists of 75% part of that entire structure, and you are getting it on NMR, which is, which is a big size also. So here you will get your methyl signals. So what we have done here, we have took two samples. I told you before also that suppose we have one original sample and one biosimilar sample, and we want to show how similar are they. If, if you if you want to show that how similar are they suppose somebody wants to take approval for this biosimilar so what they how they can use nmr they will use this methyl uh, methyl trozy experiment record for both and then do a comparison so here this is a spectra for originator and this is a spectra for biosimilar both are looking almost similar like this is a visual inspection and later on we have done some pc and some other biostatical analysis also that paper is still under revision that will publish later. So this is a very important work, especially today, if you read about what is biosimilars and how they are, and how they are uh, getting approvals. So NMR plays a very important role in this biosimilar industry. And this is like very latest. Everybody is not in India, but especially in US and UK, people are using this NMR technique to generate these kinds of spectrum and get approval for their drug. And these are very costly drugs, like one drug costs around 1.45 lakh, one single injection costs around 1.45 lakh. So this is the work that uh, I have done in last two years or and a half year. Thank you. Now you guys can ask so many questions. Oh, thank you so much sir, for your time and presentation. Actually, this is a very much latest for all of us and we all are from the chemistry background. So it was very interesting for us to know about this. So we have audience yeah. from the uh, master background. So I would like to uh, first uh, call to them, please, if you have any doubt, any question, so you can directly ask uh, these experts so you can get your answer. So anyone from master? Hello, sir. I am Vishal. So, Hi, Vishal. Uh, sir, I have a question that uh, so you are making this uh, kind of a protein, a large chain of protein. Yeah. So, you must have encountered a lot of stereo centers in it. So, how how you how you distinguish decipher between the which one is a uh, upper and up up and down means that. There is a possibility of which one is up going. I mean, not only I mean only CS three or which one is down. So how you can decipher that one? Yeah, you are asking about protein protein synthesis. How we uh, make protein in lab? See, protein synthesis is a no, very no, different. No, no, no. In lab, not in lab. Means that in spectroscopic technique, how you how you uh, decipher them? Which one is upper one or which one is down one? No, no. Suppose like these all are uh, marketed drugs. We don't have to uh, find which one is upper one or which one is smaller one. Okay. These, these are like already well-known drugs. We have to do the further analysis, like how, whether they are similar or not, or where the peaks are coming. If you see here, this isolation is already uh, like well-established. We don't have to find whether it's R or S or upper or down. Like we don't have to do organic or stereochemistry here. It's already uh, sorted. Okay. In no, the, sir. My question is when we are doing some, we are masters, I master students. So when I have performed these reactions, so we find something new. So how we establish these things means that we have only, uh, we took the NMR, then we have just OS peak, RCS3 peak, we have uh, some stereo center. So how, how I will distinguish that one? For that, you have to use NOSI experiment, this nuclear okay. effect. I told you like in NOSI, so that you are asking which is up and which is down. Just suppose you have one proton, which is like in within six, six angstrom of your structure, you have make a new molecule, whatever you have synthesized. Okay, so like your proton, suppose this is, that, that is an R conformer. So if it is an R conformer, that the uh, proton signal should be between six angstrom if it is nearby. So if you are getting a signal in your nosy spectrum, that means that stereochemistry is either R or S that you have to analyze later with. But for your question, like you have to use nosy experiment if you have any doubt with the stereochemistry. Okay, if sir, if I have more than six angstrom, means that we have 
like a, uh, if we don't know, like we have a disused the structure of venomycin, means that a large, large number of steroid center is there. So okay. it, it's market approved, done. but if we know, don't know that, so okay. how we can go into the decipher, means that some of the structures are more than six angles strong. Some of the stereo centers are more than six yeah. angles strong. That yeah. is your question. Yeah. Okay. Then you can do, then you can do some modification in this nosy that is known as like, um, like specifically you have to uh, choose or then you can do STD nosy in, in your case. Like I told you STD, the saturation transfer difference. So you can do STD nosy also, like a particular section or a particular, uh, or, a, or a particular uh, hearts range you can saturate and the other you can acquire. Suppose you have some some part is that, like, suppose you have a one inch spectrum and you know like these are the peaks which are uh, beyond six angstrom you already know but you want to confirm so what you will do you will saturate uh, you will saturate the other part and you will acquire your six angstrom part in this STD nosy spectrum that is known as STD NOE it is an advanced topic that I am I am not covering here okay. but for your case you can use STD nosy okay okay sir okay. thank you. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Sir, I have a doubt. Like, if we want to, uh, if we want to check the um, protein sequence, then we have to do all the toxinous and HSQC, all the experiments. Yeah, you have to do. Even sometimes you have to do cosy also. Like thing that you are seeing here. Uh, Huh. Like these signals that you are seeing, the... Yeah, the, the signals that you are seeing, this this I have uh, find from doing toxic cozy and HSQC. Like after spending three four months on toxic and cozy, then I have uh, labeled these here in the in this methyl region. So you have to spend around three four five months. That depends upon your expertise. If you are new, then you will take more time. If you are if you are experienced, you will take less time. But you have to record all the experiments, the basic experiments, toxic, nosy, cozy, and HSQC. And sir, one more question, sir. Sir, do we can find the confirmation of protein or not? Confirmation. Like I have read in somewhere that we can find or not. Confirmation, like in which which sense, like uh, alpha helical or beta sheet. Like confirmation. Like yeah, 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 sir. Like unfolded yeah, yeah. protein or folded protein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Protein. From from one D only, you can find whether your protein is folded or not. Uh, one second. Yeah, you, this is spectra is for a folded protein. This is like a well folded uh, alpha helix protein. If it is a beta sheet or it is a random coil, then this six to ten region will be narrowed. There won't be so much crowding. There will be very less peaks in a random coil. So if you have a protein sample, like those who do protein and MR first, they record a 1D. And from 1D only, they will see whether, whether it's folded or not folded. So this is for a folded spectrum. If, you're, if your uh, protein is not folded, you will get these peaks between 6 to 8 only. It will not be more. This, this range will be very less. That is the like, first uh, fingerprint for folded and unfolded protein. And sir, please uh, explain a little bit about STD. Actually, it is very interesting. I think. STD, anyone? Because we can find the uh, we can find the receptor and that uh, protein interaction. I think. Yeah, yeah, it is very interesting. Yes, sir. So, uh, what you didn't understand in this one? So, like uh, uh, when the I mean. When this coronavirus attached to the AC2 receptor, then it must attach to that some specific domain of that. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that is virus. Amino acid of that AC2. Yeah, AC2, not so the AC, in this figure, we can find the information for this small peptide for this insulin. We cannot talk, okay. we, we, we cannot uh, talk about this big receptor. But for this, we can easily say like these are the peaks which are involving. For STD, actually, uh, there is a specific conditions for STD NMR that your binding should be in a, a micromolar range. Micromolar range binding means that is, it should be a moderate binding and attach and detach, attach and detach. To find that binding thing, you have to do experiment on SPR. SPR is a different instrument, surface plasma resonance. So before coming to this NMR, I have recorded SPR in my lab. 
then i have come to nmr so if you want to do std nmr if you have two proteins then you go for spr first and find whether your protein binding is in micromolar range or in nanomolar range if it's in nanomolar then std is not possible std will fail if it's in micromolar um, uh, range binding then you can do std like there are some limitations for std but for a small molecule there is not much limitations there is 1d std also and 2d std also both you can do suppose you have to find the interaction between a drug and uh, what, like whatever drug you have developed for any anything then you can find the interaction of your null molecule against any ligand or whatever you want but for one so information so we can, get, so can we find the interaction between a virus and the receptor or not I mean, yeah we can find maybe it will depend upon the uh, upon the interaction range i mean if it is the micromolar yeah, then we yeah. can find molar yeah yeah then then then, then we can do uh, std if you if you google some papers you will easily get like interaction of uh, viral proteins with receptors using std nmr you will get people people must have done yeah and we will also i mean might be able to find the confirmation that what kind of confirmation change takes place between the in the viral protein i think when it uh, interact with the receptor i mean if it's possible for yeah for this study like this is a like this is a hierarchy what you are asking like first first we will do spr and then we will move to nmr and from this nmr we will go to docking computational docking head dock i have done docking also for these receptor that i am not showing you because that is not a part of nmr so what we'll do like suppose we'll get these receptors Suppose we get these epitopes, this uh, leucine six, L seventeen, L six, or whatever. So what we'll do, Headdoc is a uh, online docking platform developed by Utrecht University. So that what we'll do, we'll we'll take our receptor and we'll take our insulin and we'll do a computational binding. So that will generate a binding model in which you can see what is the confirmation changing, what is the possible confirmation is changing in the receptor and in the ligand or in the insulin. Like what is a binding site that you can see in in that docking platform? So I have covered only animal part. Like oh, this is our entire yes. hierarchy. Then then you will move to. But so it is very parts. interesting. I think STD. I think it is very interesting for me. Mostly STD. For everyone, it is interesting. Like animal is a very interesting yes. topic. So yes, it is very interesting. interesting. Yeah. Anyone from master's like Priya. Uh, sir, actually, I wanted to ask. Like, I am a master's student. I don't know much about yeah. it, but uh, I want yeah. to ask that uh, you said that this uh, first we do SPR and then we go to NMR and then we further go to uh, docking studies. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and I guess all these uh, data that we are getting, we uh, match. We or we compare it with some standard, like from protein data bank or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, obviously, yeah. If we get something uh, which is like not known in the standard, so which how? Which is normal. Like you are saying that, like whatever you are, uh, like whatever thing you are trying to do, like whatever confirmation or whatever document you want to see, is novel or not? Yes, sir. So see, it's it's a very and it's a very big world if you are. Going to do that kind of research. I mean, that's kind of a very good work. In my knowledge, like very less people have done this kind of work using NMR. But cryo EM you can use. Cryo EM is a technique like the cryo electron microscopy that will give you much more detailed information than NMR. And in, from that cryo EM graphs, you can make a map of whatever interaction are happening in a protein or a small molecule. Mostly like cryo EM is used for protein only, protein protein interaction. Like this kind of a study has been uh, established from cryo EM first, but why we are doing it from NMR? Like there is a difference between cryo EM and NMR. What we do in cryo EM, like we freeze our uh, protein, we will make a crystal kind of a thing. So the interaction will work. It's, it's not a dynamic process, but in NMR interaction is still dynamic. Like it's attaching and detaching. In cryo EM, you are freezing your molecule, so you cannot talk about the dynamic nature of the interaction. But in NMR, you can talk about the dynamicity of the thing. But if you have a novel thing, cryo EM is like better technique than NMR because it will give you much more details on like it will give you a entire mapping kind of a thing. So 
so yes you can use cryo em but if you want to do a complete novel study or a novel docking study that will be a huge work if you are going to do uh and so what are the like what is the hierarchy like where do we start and like because i think nmr and these docking are the confirmatory tests that we perform so before that you said that you did spr yeah and hierarchy is like first i recorded uh one day spectrum of uh, insulin only then like we get to know that uh, insulin interact with igf or also so then we thought like let us find what is the interaction so to find interaction we have spr only or uh, that uh, itc um uh, calorimetry technique so we we went for spr because that is uh, much more uh, specific so we did a spr study we found that it's in micromolar range then if it is in micromolar then we can come to nmr because spr will only work for micromolar range binding so we have used nmr then after getting these results in nmr we moved to head dog or any other docking platform to find like what conformation is changing or what is the binding site of two proteins of any drug or of any drug or protein interaction so this is a hierarchy like first you should have any idea like whether your protein is interacting with anything or not if it is interacting then go for spr and then find whether it is in micromolar or in nanomolar if it is in nanomolar then you should you may approach cryoem which is i think not available in india but in micromolar then you can use std and mr and then completion study okay so anybody have doubts sir shweta hello sir hello hello Sir, I have a very small doubt. So, yeah. how can we find uh, that? How many am amino acids are that coupled to form uh, the protein chain? Means, how can we differentiate this oligomer and protein in uh, NMR spectroscopy? Or we have some other techniques that I want to know. No, no, I, I, I'm not getting your question. Like, like you want to know what is the primary sequence of protein? How we know that? or how we differentiate between oligomers Oleg oligomers and proteins means how uh, yeah yes. like how uh, like how a protein in making uh, oligomer or dimer or tetramer like that yeah yeah how we can differentiate that and our uh, that complete compound is form is oligomer or protein for that dosage so is best happening you, to, you just have to record one dosage spectrum uh, dosage if you see here in, in dosage spectrum suppose this is a monomer okay and this is giving you a diffusion coefficient as minus 10.5 okay this suppose if if it's if it's getting aggregated it is making a dimer or trimer or tetramer so what will happen if the molecule becomes large then the diffusion coefficient become low and what Sir, 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 your sound is not coming. Actually, I live near airport, so the flight was going. That's why. So, so suppose if you if you have a monomer, then your diffusion coefficient will come somewhere here. If it's become a oligomer, like suppose tetramer, then this diffusion coefficient will become more higher, like eleven towards twelve, thirteen, fourteen. So if you are getting a higher oligomer like a higher diffusion coefficient that means you have a uh, that, that means your protein is making oligomers from dosi you can easily find whether it's making oligomer or not okay sir thank you sir. so anyone from audience Actually, okay. So, sir, uh, it is very thankful to you that you took uh, you made a beautiful talk for us. 
It's a really interesting. Thank you, thank you for inviting me here. Thank you, sir. And uh, uh, means more most of the yes, things really are the research. Thank you. This is background, so we get idea for the how many different kind of the spectroscopy are using and wide range of the NMR because we are the only people, so we just care about the 2D NMR like cosinology and this thing. But in the bio pharmaceutical, you have already mentioned there are the several things are there which have to focus on this. So thanks to you. Good idea about one one more thing I want to mention like like when we are in masters on initial days of PhD we think about like we are from organic background or from yes, chemistry sir. background how how we will jump to this biology I I was from industrial chemistry background not even from organic background I didn't know anything about amino acids or like protein or peptides whatever I have learned I have learned three years back during my projects in IIT. Don't think that you are from organic background, you cannot do these things. And at present time, organic chemistry is like getting saturated and people are shifting yes, towards sir. biology or mostly yes, biochemistry. Yes, so please, please be open for biology and biochemistry things. Don't think that you are from organic chemistry, you can't do biology, you can do anything. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you to all for joining us and next session we will meet on Sunday, Sunday evening. Thank you so much, sir. Now everybody can leave. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, can I stop this? Yes, sir. I said send me to uh, send the uh, a PDF as well as the uh, PPT file of this thing. So that we can this I cannot PDF. share because some work is still uh, yet to be published. So I cannot okay. share with you these. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Once it gets published, I will uh, share. Okay, sir. I will wait for that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, bye.